Morning all, thank you for joining the webinar. I think we'll just give it a minute more and then we'll start. Um, just give it a second, just for the guys that's joining in um, and then we'll, we can start the, the webinar. So hi guys, uh, welcome to the webinar and thank you for joining me on this Friday morning. <laughs> I know everyone's quite busy, it's end of year, but thank you for the time, it's much appreciated. Uh, the webinar is the conversion of AAC, AEC and manufacturing or manufacturing AEC, hosted by Baker Baines and myself, uh, Daniil. Um, let's jump into the agenda very quickly. So just a quick uh, run through the agenda. We're looking at the overview. So basically some history behind this, uh, the conversions, um, an introduction to what it is, basically some background knowledge, some technical fit histories. We look at BIM, we look at uh, tools like Inventor that collaborates with other tools like Revit, uh, InfraWorks. We use Dynamo, really, really cool example with Dynamo and, and Inventor and Revit. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we look at some of the, the industries that we can serve uh, or how this works and where does it serve predominantly. And we look at the summary and then there's a question and answer session. It is something which is very, very interesting. Uh, I think especially from uh, mechanical guys or mechanical background, people that use Inventor uh, and how this transitions from not just the mechanical design, it moves on to uh, you know building products, bridges, uh, for infrastructure, uh, you know, mechanical components that we make, but fit in a building or a plant, for instance. So without further ado, let's jump into some of the introduction, the history behind it. Now, so this is something that's not new. It's been around since before. Uh, and we find that, um, we find that it has evolved over the years. Now, this is basically having uh, products pre-manufactured or prefabbed and taken out to site for fitting uh, or being used on a site, a building or a plant, for instance. And we see that as it progressed down the lines, uh, we see that it's been predominantly used in uh, the construction area of it, right? However, we're finding a lot more uh, use of uh, manufacturing to BIM or manufacturing to construction in the process plant environment, the infrastructure environment, um, as well as, uh, you know, architecture, which always been there. And we see that it doesn't just suit one industry. It's there for all, for, for multiple types. So there's four key disciplines that we look at here for manufacturing, for construction. Building products, number one, building equipment. Okay, things like chillers, uh, you know, the air conditioning units, HVAC units, uh, custom fabrication, right? Um, which it could be on, like you see on the on the screen on the on the top right and left hand corner, you'll see that it is customized window fabrication uh, or window facades, for instance. But also infrastructure. Now the step into infrastructure is becoming a lot more um predominant where uh, the steel work in a bridge for instance uh, should actually be designed in a mechanical tool because it's more mechanical and then that's been taken across right and if we look at it it doesn't just necessarily need to be one uh, type of industry it's multiple facets and in the heart of this we have inventor now you'll find that other products uh, like autocad revit infraworks civil 3d connect in and out of Inventor. Now, there is workflows that we will discuss and I'll show you as we go along, what are the best and ideal workflows to do that. Let's jump into the first one, building products. So for discrete manufacturing elements, standard configurable building items that we could use, also looking at um, you know, making it easier, uh, uh, accessing specified content, right? But also ideal fit for online catalogs. Now we found, uh, with some client experience, you know, people want to manufacture uh, components that go into a building. Could be interiors, it could be exteriors, facades, window fittings. But 
it needs to be configurable, easy for them to work with, easy, easy to configure, and from there get drawings. Now, I'm going to take you through some of the um, 2D to 3D workflows, as well as using these components for uh, for uh, for the, the transition. So in here, we're going to take advantage of a 2D workflow existing components, so legacy data. We call in the mechanical or the, the, the AutoCAD file. We place it in. Now in here, this is the AutoCAD file that we're going to work off. You can see it's architecture based. We're going to project the geometry of a DWG file into it. Then this is all done in Inventor using the factory tools. So, so what you're seeing on the left is the factory um, assets that comes with the collection. So you can pull out a full bill of materials from here, right? Uh, based on what's there. Now, all we've done is we've told it, take the factory tool and align this uh, facade for the window on, on, on the left. And it gives us a full bill of materials. If we take it back into the, into the uh, architecture tool, you'll see that we can have that show up on the drawing. Also a bill of materials in, in here from Inventor. We can balloon it and you can see what they look like, right? Um, and full of bill of materials, ballooning it to give us a, a proper parts list. What's the advantage here is that we've got a full cutting list of our uh, component that needs to go in. Now, from a manufacturer that's putting this onto uh, doing work for architects or building uh, construction guys, this is ideal because you can actually design this around an existing building, right? So having that workflow between the two. So how do we produce intelligent components? So this is a 2D design, as you can see there. Uh, we call it up again in Inventor, we bring it in. And what we can do is remove areas that we want. Um, so we just clip out that area. We project the geometry from there. Now, what we're going to do is those components that fit on uh, that we're highlighting are the components that we're going to work with or we're going to use, right? Uh, and then the rest of them, we can actually still keep them in the drawing because we're going to we're going to use them. And all we do is we just mirror that based on our mirror plane in here. And we create a new component, right? So we create a new body of that. So it's multi-body, kind of multi-body as well as assembly modeling. So we're creating a new part. And then all we do is we pattern that component to the amount of times based on the references. And we've actually got the components that we need. So in our window facade, we've got that, right? Uh, we can place that uh, in the model or we can place some, uh, some uh, screws to make sure that it all connects nicely and we get a full bill of materials based on that. We could use iLogic as well to actually drive this. So, you know, it's one model. So we're using design automation basically, right? So it's one model uh, but with a bit of iLogic in it, which makes it very, very intelligent, mm -hmm. right? Now you'll find that in here, uh, in here we can uh, <coughs> look at uh, a tool called uh, Configurator 360. We upload that to Configurator 360, and this is gives us the configurable, uh, configurable online configurable uh, part that we require. So this is always often um, often used in in environments where we on site we want to be able to uh, configure in front of a customer or show them what it looks like. We saw that we can we can export it out to a Revit family. We bring it in. And that's being used in Revit now. Uh, you know, a customer could use it or architect could use it in the models. And as you can see, we're going to place it in, in Revit. If we go look at it, we can pattern it as well, add a couple of more of them. And what we can do is if we go into a 3D model, you can see it now in here, how it shows up on the building, which is really cool, right? Uh, because what it does is allows us to communicate our design from mechanical to architecture. Often we find that there's a break. It stops where the manufacturer stops it and it does not get transferred across. Now this workflow you'll see is used in multiple facets. So it could be the first one we saw was in the architecture environment. As we move along, you'll see that we can use it in the infrastructure and the very same principle and workflow can work in the plant environment as well. 
So if we look at it, um, configurable, so engineered, uh, it's it's engineered to order basically, right? So it's it's configured to the order. So it's 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 very bespoke. You can make your components bespoke to what is being uh, ordered or what's being requested from a customer, right? Sometimes uh, it's it's complex uh, to integrate to building systems using methods like this. You can have that design intent earlier on in the design. And if we look at the connection service between the two, uh, the MEP connection, um, you'll find that there is multiple facets in there uh, as we can work as well. So for especially when it comes to uh, mechanical, electrical and plumbing services for a building, mechanical is very, very important and the design prehand is there as well. And some of the examples could be lifts, escalators, HVAC units like you see on screen. So let's have a look at this component. Now in here, you'll find that this is a, uh, a mechanical component. We're gonna shrink wrap it. So what is the workflow? We will shrink wrap this. Uh, we exclude certain components because in here, we do not wanna give away any of our, uh, our you know, intelligence that's in there. So we wanna be able to just share uh, connection points and fitting areas uh, in, in our design. And if you look at the features, we can close up certain features. So we only want to share what is available for the guys to use uh, in their design. We don't want to give them any information that's not, uh, that could be our IP, right? We close off certain uh, design aspects to that. We can preview it again. The holes may be something that perhaps not required, so we can block them off or maybe it is required for mounting. It, it's all dependent on, on the design criteria. And if we go, okay, what it does, it creates a shrink wrap of the model for us, right? And remember those holes that we specified, these could be mounting holes, you'll see them in there. The other components are just areas that are, uh, that will be used downstream, right? In the design. Now, if we look at it, uh, sorry, let's move along. If you look at it in here, we're excluding the components again. Um, sorry, I think we're repeating that. And that's how we would remove components for it. Now, what it can, we can become quite significant if it's project specific, all right? Elements that need to be used on a specific project, use the BIM for manufacturing, but in, uh, out of uh, uh, inventor, and you could get that to be uh, shrink wrap like the way we did there. So we simplify it basically, right? Uh, you could rely on uh, different areas of, of it. So, you know, it could be uh, building interface for fitment. So how do you make sure whatever you design is fits what is required in the building? So this is a nice way to check it. And if any alterations or updates needs to happen, you can have that pre, uh, pre uh, installation, right? So basically before you install, you know it will fit correctly, okay? If it's also, uh, aids us in certain areas. So the data is deliverable. Uh, the delivery is, is is flexible. So in this way that if something needs to change, something needs to be modified, it's easier to do it before it's actually built, right? But also here, the example of this is things like facades, stairways, railings, some chimneys, balconies. In the next example, we'll show you uh, an example of, uh, sorry. Uh, Okay, uh, so if I look at this here, yeah, sorry, I don't know what's happened there. Just give me a second. So in here, this is the, the balcony that we're gonna use. So if we if we open up, this is Vault, so data management. Uh, we're using Vault to manage our data in here. We can preview what it looks like. Uh, if there's any change orders, if there's any changes that need to happen to it, uh, we can edit the change order, add that in and we can see how that balcony is gonna change. So the idea behind this is to have all of the technicalities that we need to work off, as you can see on screen, that needs to change, something changed on site. Uh, so again, becoming scalable as well as flexible, right? Now, uh, we can copy a design quite easily without, without uh, having issues of links, right? We can rename them quite easily in there uh, and we can reuse them. And you'll see that the numbers have, the drawing numbers have changed. We brought them into the folder that we want to copy them into and we create the copy, right? So from this copy, we're going to actually see how it works in the building. So again, in Revit, we're going to call up the, open up in Inventor, we can open up the Revit file. 
Uh, and this is just to check our form and fit, right? Um, we're going to place our, our, our balcony that we've just uh, copied because we've got edits to do to it. And we're going to actually go and constrain that to the building. And we're using the constraint by UCS. So it constrains it to the building that we're going to work off. Now here, because we've got iLogic in it, we can actually change the way the balcony operates. So if we want two, for instance, we've got that. We can change the width. We can change the depth of it. Um, and we can actually see how that fits in. Again, taking that into a drawing, uh, because it's Inventor, you've got the full functionality bullet materials, as well as cut lists if you have if you require. And back in Inventor, we can change the way we want it to be. So we can export it out for BIM, uh, so it removes extra details. And, and if we go in from here, we can author this component. Um, that's going to be used downstream. Level of details are important, especially when you when you pushing it out to programs like like Revit for the BIM level of details, which we'll discuss later on. And you'll see that it is exported out now. Um, we can call it into the Revit model, and there we go. Now we know that we can ensure that it fits the way we want it to fit, uh, or the architect knows that it will fit or work in the in the model. And if there's any changes that needs to happen, that could happen beforehand which is really cool, right? If we look at a modular construction design, so in here, um, we look at uh, something which is uh, perhaps prefab, um, which needs to be fabricated on site. Uh, well, not fabricated, but assembled on site, but prefab in, in, in a workshop. Uh, and again, using the intelligence of Inventor with iLogic, we can start adding uh, specific properties to it, which is really, really nice, right? And You'll see what it does here. It starts adding in the components of this, uh, of this, uh, let's call it a, fab, uh, a prefab building, right? Um, and using Inventor again, we can start uh, modifying what we've got, adding, uh, adding a pattern to it, or duplicating certain designs, part of the design, adding in more, inf adding in more uh, uh, panels or windows to that model. And this is all driven by Inventor iLogic, right? Um, which is really, really interesting if we look at it. And within a few moments, we've actually got a prefab building which we can use on site, which is really, really cool. Uh, if we look at the bullet materials again, we can see that there is a full cutting list that we can get out of this. So we can export it out as well uh, to an Excel sheet if we need. Or if we're using Autodesk Vault, we can put this into Vault and pull an item list off from what's in here. Okay, so let's look at the areas of infrastructure. Now, we've spoken more architecture. Uh, if we look at the infrastructure side of it, uh, often we find that um, components that's being used in the civil industry, uh, they, they, they are, there's a lot of mechanical references to that. Now, in here, Inventor or the BIM for ma manufacturing for BIM side of it, or for construction, allows us uh, to create intelligent infrastructure components, right, which can be uh, updated or changed, right? If it's more complex, uh, which requires more capability, you've got that functionality with Inventor, and there's a library for uh, for this. Once you start creating this, these components uh, or these models, th that forms a library that can be used inside of infrastructure, InfraWorks, or Civil 3D, all right? Now, the examples over here, are things like roads, drainage, uh, any furniture, some bridge elements that we can work with. Now, the next example we're going to look at is intelligent infrastructure content. So basically, this is more or less the bridge components. Now, in here, this is InfraWorks that comes up, right? Uh, I don't know why that's not gone away, but let's have a look. Here we go. So this is Inventor. What we do is we're going to model up, uh, and also again using parameters and iLogic, we're going to change uh, changes, and we will export this out to be used inside of the InfraWorks. So this is InfraWorks. Uh, the nice thing it links up very nicely with Inventor and Inventor iLogic, uh, so we can use this uh, our mechanical designs in here. Now we select the component. Now you see that that pier that we've that we've just uh, created inside of uh, Inventor. We can bring that in. It's got parameters that comes across, as you can see in there, um, as well as uh, we can change depth, slopes, 
uh, of that component. Now, which is really, really cool because what it does is allows us to do this design initially in a uh, tool like Inventor, a powerful tool like Inventor, which can be brought across. And if we apply that to all of the all of the pillars, you see that it has updated. Okay, which is really, really nice. Uh, we can add this to a library. So that could be used later on. And what it does is it exports it out and we can always call this up at a later stage. Now, uh, here you've, you, can, you can see the footing of that uh, pillar and what it looks like. This is in Revit using the, the structure side of it. Um, if it's exported out, you can see what it looks like in there. And that's using inventor para, uh, InfoWorks with the inventor parametric models, which is really, really cool. One step further from that is um, when you use uh, the construction for manufacturing, if it meets computational generative design, which is really, really interesting. This, I thought, was a very, very cool um, addition to this uh, presentation. The reason for this is to show you how we can incorporate a tool like Dynamo, which is predominantly used in the uh, in the architecture industry links are very nice to them with Revit but for this purpose you'll find that we're using those parameters visual scripting now we've seen inventor using uh, iLogic for uh, for adding scripts or uh, you know uh, code in the back end to actually drive uh, parametric design for automation in here we're going to use um, visual scripting uh, for uh for for Revit. but we take that same information into inventor and you see how quick and easy it is now there's uh, uh there's a there's a roller coaster design there's a you can you can follow this up in youtube right uh euthanasia coaster so basically it's designed to kill you <laughs> if it doesn't kill you it's going to really really scare you uh and imagine having a design of this nature designed in an architecture program you wouldn't really it wouldn't really be uh, suited because it's more a mechanical design right uh, now what we do is we use skeleton modeling right so there's different types of skeleton modeling to do this uh, we use the top down design method right uh, which is more common right for this type of skeleton modeling for frame it's easy to modify it it references common connections or critical uh, connections from a single point and if we look at some of the types of skeletons you've got surface patches you've got 2d or 3d lines and you've also got got solids right now you can take off use this as a skeleton which in in any of these three what it does do so we use inventor professional in here so the frame fabrication workflow uh, a skeleton part right we start off with the skeleton sketch uh, we place that sketch in an assembly from there, we use the uh, uh, skeleton geometry frame generator to generate the frames for it. And then from that frame generator, we can pull out part files. So we can look at the, uh, the, the cut list and, and the bullet materials as well as the single parts from there. Again, if we look at the workflow again, we can do detail on the frame. So in treatments like notching, we could do uh, miters. Following that, we can do frame simulation. So we can do an analysis of the frame to see what's going on. We can create the bullet materials and we can create the drawing for documentation purposes, right? This is all an inventor workflow. So it's an inventor frame generator workflow. If we go into it, what does the computational design do? So the user defines the relationship between traditional drawing or the sculpted element. Then the data is created and the relationship is created in between that. And then from there, we can pull out a, uh, a automatic execution of the rules. So we create the form, uh, the Dynamo scripting form, and then we can actually show how that rules are going to work. So Dynamo looks something like this. So basically, conventional scripting would ask us to actually write down a specific code, right? So um, either you do it in VB or uh, you know whichever pro uh, pro programming language that you'd use, um, and you would have to put in if then or uh, true and false statements, right? So some examples of that. With regards to Dynamo, on the other hand, it looks something like this. So it's visual. You would pull out from a Dropbox, uh, from a from a from a box sort of pick pick box exercise. You would put it in, and it links it to specific parts of what type of bend you're going to use, or what type of components are there, which makes it a lot easier because these are predefined snippets, right? And then 
the next one is in here in this in this example what's being used you'll see on the right hand side that looks something like what what the end product's going to be right in here, uh, it's uh, Dynamo uh, Sandbox, Inventor Professional, and Project Refinery that's being used in this example, right? Now, uh, how does it work, right? So uh, we also use generative design in here. So generative design, what it does is it allows us to look at specific parameters that we're going to give it. So we tell it, um, you know, what are the stresses gonna be, what size sizes are we gonna work with, uh, you know how how much uh, of weight we require this to have, and what it does, it it runs through uh, thousands of different iterations and gives us the best results from there. Now, if we look at it in here, this is the the computational design workflow. We use Dynamo. We use this project refinery, which is still in beta phase. We use Dynamo again in Excel. We we export the the Dynamo uh, point data or results into Excel, so it gives us specific points. Those points can be imported into Inventor to give us a, uh, a outline of what we need. And then from there, we use skeleton modeling technique and we use the frame generator, all right? So it's actually quite cool. So let's, let's show you what Dynamo looks like. So in here, you can see this is what the interface looks like. Uh, we call it in and all it is, is just doing pulling out different, uh, uh, you know snippets so we can actually call up the snippets as we go along so now in here we're telling it um, that needs to connect there and that needs to connect there. And as you can see it's as we're connecting them it's actually building it in the background for us now these points become critical when we're doing the design because that needs to be exported to excel and brought into inventor for that case right so in here you can see that we can change uh, specific scripts right just by highlighting it by clicking and getting the different scripts that we need and we can see how that populates and works in the background. So what's important is we also tell it from the struts, the definition of the struts, what's going to be there. Um, we can tell uh, tell the program what we need, the way it needs to connect. And as you can see, we're doing it. It's updating a visualization file for us in the background. This is what it looks like. This is basically what a roller coaster will, will look like when we when we're done with it, right? Um, if we go into it again, we can start adding certain surface geometry that comes up in here, cylinder, how we want it to curve from a visualization point of view, right? And we can also go and look at the analysis as well in here. And what this will allow us to do is actually analyze what it's going to look like uh, when we complete that, right? If we go into it again, from the analysis side of it, we can see that uh, you know if there's something that needs to change or needs to update a specific, because it has been through a uh, analysis to tell us what are the results from the from the finite element analysis tests or the vibrations or uh, you know or the weight of the stuff of the structure, we can actually add that in into the scripting. And if we Look at the lens and options. We can change them in here, the inputs, and that can be more updated as you can see on screen. And whatever results we update in there, it updates the model directly. Now, this is very visual. It's not like uh, iLogic where you have to punch in the information. Um, but I think understanding of what it does is also quite, is the key thing in here. If we look at the, uh, this is Project Refinery, which is, which is a beta program, right? Uh, which will, should be launched soon. If we look at it, we can look at the op lens, we can look at the outputs of it, um, and we want everything to be maximized, right? The weights and structure of it to withstand specific types of structures, right? And if we create the study, it will generate a study of results for us that we can actually populate, right? So uh, if we hit generate, you'll see what it would do. It's running through some iterations in the background. So very similar to generative design, right? As you can see, there's multiple iterations of the same design, and we can check it via different variations. So number of truss segments, for instance, uh, the structure side of it, right? And let's expand that, and you can see where it is falling in. So arc length, and you'll see in here. So the graph on the side is explaining where we are based on the result, input results that we add. If we select it, you'll be able to see the components that come up in here. Now it's giving us a different iterations, not as many as generative design does give us, 
But what's great here is that we can actually go in to see the number of trust segments, uh, the weight of it, the arc lengths, the trust, uh, the 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 maximum, uh, you know, trust panel, the width of it, how it's going to work, and based on the inputs that we've added in. Okay, and looking at the number of elements. Now, of course, the more elements we have, the stronger it could become, or uh, and how we can actually modify this and work with it, right? So back in Dynamo, we've got most of it in here. We can add more elements to this if we want, or we can add more parts to it. What we've got to do is we've got to run the part script from that. What it does is it exports it to Excel. If we open up Excel in here, you'll see, uh, let's open up again, let's add a bit more variations to that. All of those points and nodes gets exported out to Excel automatically for us. And that could be inputted into Inventor, right? Okay, that's important, the name and where the nodes sit. Right, and what we can do is we can actually tell it where we want it to go in, right? So there's specific lists, so X, Y, and Z coordinates and the number of uh, splines that we're gonna use in that. And what we do is we export that out to Excel. If we open up the Excel sheet, this is the struts, as you can see there, the splines, as well as the point coordinates for them. Now, what we do next is we're gonna to have to go and take that into Inventor, as you can see in here. This is, on the left-hand side is our Dynamo script. On the right-hand side is our Inventor. We've got a, we've got a rule that, that will run the Dynamo script, so iLogic rule, and it builds it. So what it's, what hap what's happening in Inventor, actually, is, iLogic from Inventor is actually calling up that Excel sheet, which is adding the points into Inventor, but creating the geometry as it adds the points, right? So Inventor has that functionality where you can bring in Excel points and create geometry of that. If we modify it in here, inside of Dynamo on the left-hand side, some updates will happen there. That could be modified in there, right? And if we rerun our rule, you'll see that the modifications update in Inventor as well. So whatever updates happen across, you just need to rerun the rule and it happens across. Very, very cool, All right? So the next step here is to actually create the frame inside of Inventor. Now we've we've done the we've basically done the 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 points or the skeleton of that frame. Now the next is to come in with the frame itself. So again, open up the uh, the, the model. We've got the skeleton as you can see on screen. All we've got to do is make sure it is visible for us to work with. Insert a frame now with Inventor 2020, which is really cool. This is where it becomes really powerful. You choose the, 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 the standard that you're gonna work with, the size, member sizes, the type of member that you're gonna work with, and you could do a select all. You see that? Instead of doing them individually, you hit apply. Uh, with Inventor 2020, this is a really, really, well, 2019 actually, you could have done this. It's a really cool uh, uh, function where you don't have to do them individually. Just highlight, select, and give it, a, give it the proper name that you want and you hit OK, it generates it for you. And if we have a deeper look at it, you can see the frame member there, right? Now the rest of them, we still have to generate the frame for the rest of them, we switch a visibility on, switch a visibility on of the members that still need to be done. In here, we go in back into Inventor Frame, into frame Generator, choose the size of members that we're gonna work with. And again, highlight, select, and apply. And what it does is it generates the frames for us, as you can see in there. And this is real time, eh? It has not been, uh, it has not been sped up or anything of that sort. This is real time. And next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at mitering and notching it. So we've got the frame, we've got the members connecting, we have to mitre and notch them, all right? Because we do the end treatments on them. So again, looking at the end treatments in here, we could select that, the members that we wanna mitre notch. And you can see that 
these members needs to be uh, notched in mitered sorry in there uh, we can choose the gap size if there's welding that needs to happen to it select highlight select this is available in vendor 2020 or 2019.2 uh, onwards the dot release point two and you'll see it does multiple end treatments at the same time which is really cool see that with even with the uh with the might uh, the gaps that we allowed for it that's in there if we bring that in we can have a look at it in here uh, notice that if we have to notch this um, again the selection type we pick the members that we want to notch the frame member that we're going to notch to right and we okay that and it does a notch for us right and you can see what it looks like once it has been notched against that which is really cool so it gives us the proper cut based on the selections that we've added so we can miter and notch at the same time as well right um, if you go back into it, uh, the bill of material structure, right? We can look at the bomb, and in here you'll see that there's a cutting list that we can, well, the bill of materials that we've got that's there with the sizes that we can either export or uh, and the quantities. And if we're looking at, if we're using a tool like Vault, we can use the items in here as well. Which is great. Okay. Um, we've also got the bill of materials that we can pull out from there. Of the main structure, we can enable the bomb view, certain components. And we could add columns to this if we require. And the quantity items, just by dragging it, we can see that how many of them are there for us, right? Okay, really nice. We can actually see how this works. Um, and pull them out for manufacturing. So we can use this in the manufacturing environment. We know how what's the cut length going to be. Uh, we can see the notch detail in here. So this is a custom property that we've added in here, cut detail, and you see that it'll tell us the degree of mitre as well. Okay, that's all available in there. We can choose our column, so we can add it to our columns, and then uh, once it's added in, it'll show up in the bill of materials, which can be exported. Um, and you can see it come up in there. If you go OK, expand the bullet materials a bit, you'll be able to see what the cut details are of the specific items that we've mitered or notched, right? So in treatment details can be populated. OK, really cool. Uh, that gives us a brief understanding of what the, uh, the BIMFL manufacturing can do, integrating with the um with tools like dynamo uh to give us that automation right but if you look at it uh it all contributes to the way we work right and the industry 4.0 is where we're trying to actually drive ourselves to where uh detail and represent representations are quite fundamental but also collaboration and data reuse is very very important now if we look at uh factory design so factory utilities which is inside of inventor uh, well, inside of the product design and manufacturing collection, uh, which links up very nicely with Inventor. Now, this is where it becomes quite interesting, where we actually laying out specific components. It does not necessarily need to be a factory itself. If we've got predefined components uh, or parts or models, we can bring that in. Now, this is the very same design uh, that we've done in 2D. You synchronize with Inventor, and those models update to 3D components, as you're seeing in here. They've got intelligence because they're parameter driven, so you can change sizes or widths uh, dependent on what's there. You've got the same library that links up to Inventor, so if you add them in, uh, they snap. So this is where it becomes key, right? Imagine constraining this. Here you just tell it where it needs to go. There's predefined connectors, it connects and it snaps. 
And of course, there's changes that you can make with sizes like that. And because they snap together, they quite intelligent, they they connect to each other, right? So there's connectors that's driven and linked to this. Now, handrails, for instance, we can change the width of them. Uh, and you'll see they do update based on the inputs that we put in. If we take this into Navis Works for a visualization, uh, we can do a walkthrough and we can actually have a review of the design uh, via this. And what's great here is we can pick up any clashes, uh, or any issues that's there. We can redline, we can mock up certain areas for review. Uh, for instance, if we add a text note here uh, to check the safety perhaps of the fence, there's no safety fence there. Um, we can actually have that populate as well. And of course, whatever we put in from a uh, con inventor constraint point of view, those constraints can be animated as you've seen in there. It all boils down to the main things, uh, using Vault Professional in that to manage the data that's around all of these components, right? So for AutoCAD, Inventor, Navisworks, as well as BIM 360, uh, we can drive that off Vault, where we manage that data, right? What it allows us to do is to control and share data consistently. It's a centralized data, data point. So if we're using BIM 360 Docs, for instance, it's a 24 seven available, it's cloud. Uh, we can access it from anywhere, anytime but it's also great for coordination, all right? And if we look at the cloud collaboration point of view, uh, it's the same model that we've just looked at now. We're gonna add that in to from Vault and exactly from Vault, we're gonna share the design uh, to external collaboration, right? Via our work, our, our life cycle. And this is BIM 360 docs. We do an attachment, an update of that attachment and we can view it. Now, this is basically live and you'll be able to measure, you'll be able to do a review on this, but also what, what is important is if you've got to share a design with someone that is not in your drawing office or in your environment, or may, perhaps someone's on site, uh, it becomes critical in this way that you can share a design really quickly to them, give them a due date, a cause on that, and it'll be created. So this is an issue we're creating. So we basically, um, saying that there's a problem, uh, increase the height, and the person who, the recipient of that of that comment will be able to get a notification saying that there is a change that needs to happen, and that goes ahead, which is really great because it allows us to actually collaborate at a real time uh, with external people. It could be contractors, project managers, stakeholders, or even customers as well. And as we move along it, we can see there's some more areas to be modified. We can do markups and reviews. And these markups and reviews could be all electronic, as you can see in here. Um, and we can make those changes as required. So where does it become important and how does it work? We've seen and we know that the um, collaboration uh, between uh, manufacturing and construction uh, is evolving and there are tools available for us to actually um, to actually take this a step further and work with it. Um, you know that there's tools like uh, Recap for the laser scan, AutoCAD, there's plant layouts, AutoCAD layouts, uh, uh, Revit models that can be integrated into Inventor and from Inventor that could be pushed out into different facets or different areas. So we could take it from Inventor uh, to Revit, for instance, with intelligence, Inventor to infrastructure, uh, tools like uh, InfraWorks or Civil 3D, and that could be outputted into various aspects. So it could be outputted back into AutoCAD or uh, Revit or Navisworks for reviews. And if we take it a step further with the cloud collaboration, like BIM 360 docs, we can see that we can export it. Well, we can share that data or collaborate that data to users that perhaps doesn't sit in our, in our organization. So, or someone that's on site, as well as if we take it a step further, we can go into virtual reality from there to have the full virtual reality experience. 
Okay, uh, so it is quite uh, uh, an interesting topic if you look at it. Uh, I'm going to stop it here, close it here, uh, and open up questions uh, for for the team. So please, if you have any questions, please put them in the type box, and we can answer them very quickly. So you can have the chat box or you can raise a hand and we'll be able to answer these questions for you. Okay, so I see there's a question, say, can Navis work, Navis works work with inventor models too? Yes, definitely. Mm. So ideally what you would do is you would have the uh, inventor models, um, you know, you could uh, take those inventor models into Navis works for reviews and crash detection, so you can append them in there, um, or you can open them up in there and you can work with them from there, so definitely yes, you can. Any more questions? If there's any questions, please use the type box and we can answer them. Or alternatively, you can get in contact with me after the webinar on, on my email, or that is Daniel, D-A-N-E-E-L -E at bakerbains.com. It's the same email address that you've got um, on the invite for the webinar. Uh, alternatively, info at bakerbains if there's any questions. Or if you want to get in touch with us to have a conversation about it, please just let us know. So we'll leave it open for a couple of more minutes for any questions. If there is, please use the type box and we'll be able to um, we'll be able to answer them. So there's a question here. Um, let's say we have a shuttle car model and need to do a clash detection while I'm on site, can BIM 360, sorry, I just wanna try and get this type box um, bigger. So let's have a look. Can BIM 360 be ideal for such exercise? Yes, uh, you could use BIM 360 for the collaboration, which is great because what you can do is, uh, if if that model is being and also it depends on what type uh, of design is it is it um, uh, is it a mechanical design um, inventor model if it's inventor then uh, ideally not BIM 360 because it would not uh, currently does not support the IAM file format you would use the shared view from inventor to someone that's on site um, or ideally Vault Vault shared view. Um, and you can check it on site to make sure that uh, it does fit or work the way it's supposed to. If there's any reviews or markups that you can do, the person on site can do it via the mobile device or computer uh, on site. And whatever markups has been done, if they reply back with the shared view, you will get that information and you can collaborate and work with it. So, yeah, not ideally if it's if it's if it's inventor tools uh, like inventor professional. If it's an assembly file, ideally not BIM 360 just yet because of the file format being supported. All right. So no, not not BIM 360. I would use Vault for that. So if it is mechanical inventor tools, no, uh, use Vault, um, Autodesk Vault, or the shared view directly inside of Inventor. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, gentlemen and, and ladies. Uh, thank you for joining the, the, the webinar today. I look forward to 
uh, having you on the next webinar that we host, um, which will, which I will be doing uh, in the new year. So uh, if we don't speak in between that, have a wonderful Christmas and a very uh, wonderful new year as well. Um, and we can work with that. So uh, uh, Lindiwe, let's, let's, can, can we have a chat about this afterward? Um, uh, you can, we can discuss vault uh, if that's okay. How does one get vault? Um, that's a question. Please let's let's get in touch afterward, and we can have a discussion around that, an in-depth discussion around that. Thank you very much. Have a great day ahead, uh, and look forward to seeing you in the next webinar.